Hello, Banvilles. Hi. How are you, Robbie? Good. How's Juniper? Asleep. She's good. She's <laughs> sleeping. What's her long schedule long. like? Her schedule is uh, sporadic, but um, she typically takes four naps a day, but they're like, they're like an adult power nap. It's really funny. She'll like sleep for 30 to 45 minutes and then she'll be like up and raring to go. <laughs> and then we're very fortunate because she sleeps nine to 10 hours that night. So wow. that's been really great, except for the last two days, of course. But, um, <laughs> but no, she's doing really well. She'll be five months on Friday next week. Wow. Which is crazy. And so. she doesn't know the difference between pre-quarantine life and quarantine life so she's fine yeah she doesn't know she doesn't know that there are places we can't go because she's never been there <laughs> so but she does freak out a little bit when we put our masks on to go outside because she'll look at us like who are you <laughs> yeah and then we'll kind of like do like it's me and she's like oh, okay and then you put it back on she's like who are you and we're like okay, cool short memory <laughs> it's like a game of peekaboo constantly exactly yes <laughs> how are you doing good good very good a lot of like hiking this week which has been nice what's your what is your number one hike that you've been that you've gone on um i went on this great hike like up in um what is it san juan capistrano oh it was yeah. just like all on the water and it was just like miles and miles it was it was beautiful that's so great beautiful views that's awesome um so why don't you i know a little bit of the story of how you both met but why don't you let us all know yes um we'll just repeat our wedding toast because oh, that was stop. our wedding toast as we <laughs> retold how we met um it actually all started with sean murray hmm. um interestingly enough oh that's right uh so he cast me in a stage reading of man of la mancha eight nine years ago now um i was very new to theater i had i hadn't done anything professionally yet and he cast me in that and that's where i met ralph johnson um and justine twazan was also in that so i met justine mm. and they did a production of gypsy with, with me Katie. at ion theater um when they were on sixth and pen and so they invited Brian to come see it when it was playing and I was playing Louise that time. Yeah. Um, it's funny that I played the older sister and then a few years later played the younger sister. I know. Anyways, <laughs> um, to see Gypsy. And if and you remember, Ion was a very small theater, very intimate. I yeah. missed it. I was sitting very close <laughs> to Katie's, Anyways. Um, like I got a very nice close up of her Brian. singing Little Lamb, and then she <laughs> maybe had a costume so, malfunction that happened oh. during the striptease. <gasps> <laughs> but anyway, afterwards, we, um, I noticed her because she came out, and if anyone knows Derek Livingston, uh -huh. this giant yes. tall man, like saw him got so excited and gave him like katie's iconic koala hug meaning like she climbed up on his body and gave him like a hug Aww. um and i thought it was very cute and so ralph and justine and some of the other actors invited me out to for a drink afterwards we went to number one on four fifth, fifth number one mm -hmm. on fifth um and at some point during the conversation i was like so tell me the story of like the girl playing louise and ralph said oh, you're not gay? <laughs> um, and I was like, oh, no, I mean, no, but, like, tell me her story. So Ralph Johnson set us up on a blind date, blind date um, <laughs> that went very well. And then Heather Bros was supposed to, uh, she was having a Christmas party, and Katie was apparently talking about me, and so Heather reached out to me and invited me, and I didn't really know Heather except for the male La Mancha reading. And um, that's where like our initial second date was, first date, second date, I don't even remember. That's where we were supposed to meet or something. And, um, and I didn't go. I like got sick or had an excuse because I'm a, a weirdo wimp. Um, so then we 
I mean, our story goes on and on, and it's very weird. This could go on for 20 minutes, but that's the gist of how we met. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the cute stuff is, like, we now live in the neighborhood where we had our first date, which is, like, mm-hmm. if anyone knows Red House and University mm-hmm. Heights, it used to be called Park Boulevard Wine and Pizza. Yeah. Pizza and wine, whatever it was. Um, that's where we had our first date. Our second date, we both couldn't show up to because she got into a car accident. And I drilled a hole in my finger and we both were in urgent care and we both called each other being like, sorry, I have to cancel the date because I'm in urgent care. And then, so for our second date, we actually showed up to our second date in the same rental car um, because my car died that same night. It was crazy. So it was all kismet. We were meant to be together (laughs) in our white Yaris's. But that's how we met. And Juniper's awake. Say hi. And then came Juniper. And then, and then came, came Juniper. Juniper. <laughs> hi. That's true. How you doing? Hi. You excited? You want to say hi to Robbie? Say hi. Hi, oh. June. Hi. Juniper. <laughs> Aww. Do you have nicknames for her or do you hate the nicknames? Uh, we, we usually call her Junie. Mm-hmm. Um, but my brother's... Uh, her name is Juniper, and he, instead of calling her Junie or June, like a normal person, he calls her Nipper, which I hate. <laughs> so <laughs> I like all the nicknames, Junebug, Junie, Junini, but Nipper. I, that's the only one I can't stand, so of course he's going to call her that. And we both forever. randomly called call her Bubba all the time, and I have no idea why, where that came I from. Bubba. We're like, oh, Bubba. Oh. We call her Junie. Yeah. Anthony Methman calls her Junebug. Yes. Junebug. Junebug. Um, so, well, how? Tell me about your creative journeys. How you got to where you are now? Did you start um, out in theater? I mean, how long have you been doing it? We basically we kind of have opposite journeys. I've been <laughs> doing. I went to a performing arts school when I was a kid. Um, I actually went to a school with Geraldine Brawl from K through eight at a performing arts school. Oh, wow. Um, where, where was the school? Where, where did you grow up? Vista. It mm. was in Vista. It was in the 90s when they still had funding for arts education. Um, so I've always done, I've always done theater. Um, I started out as a dancer, but I had always done theater at school, and then I just kind of made my way into doing musicals, um, of being a dancer first, and went to college and got my BFA and then went to New York and did that whole thing. I ended up in New York or um, in San Diego back here kind of by accident. I was out here on vacation and auditioned for a show that I saw posting for on Facebook of all things. And this was before people posted auditions all the time on Facebook because Facebook was still pretty new, which tells you how long ago it was. Um, And it was for Hello Dolly at Starlight. It was their last show with Melinda Gilb. Um, oh wow! Dolly. So, and when I was out, when I was doing that, I ended up auditioning for Cabaret at Signet the, um, when they did it nine, ten years ago now. So yeah, um, that's. I mean, I've been doing theater kind of forever, and it's just kind of always been my life. And then Brian's the opposite. He like didn't do any theater until your mid twenties. Yeah, I did. So when I was in seventh grade, I was asked to audition for You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown, um, where they cast like seven Charlie Browns, and I was one of the seven Charlie. Um, And I did that, and I actually really liked it. And then in eighth grade, I had two really horrible experiences, one with with our eighth grade performing arts teacher. She was brand new, and she thought that the best way to direct a show was with a whistle. Um, and so anytime that people were not like doing what she wanted, she would blow her whistle and say, stop that right now. And she would get in your face and yell at you. Um, my goodness. We're doing a schoolhouse rock live. Um, and so I did that. And then I was through that. I met some people who like did community theater and I did a, uh, a production of Newsies before Newsies was actually (laughs) a licensable production. (laughs) Um, uh, I remember specifically my character's name was Bumlets. I was one of the newsies. My character name was Bumlets. Uh, I had two lines, um, and the director kept yelling at me. He's like, that's not how to say the line like this. And I would repeat him. He'd be like, I don't like that. Say it like this. 
And so I decided in my high school, you had to choose sports or theater because they all overlapped. You couldn't do both. Um, and so I chose sports. So I did sports for four years. Um, I still liked singing. So I still sang in high school. And then when I got to college, I sang in an acapella group for four years, um, right. which was super fun. We were a co-ed group. Uh, we were almost on the first uh, season of The Sing-Off on NBC. Mm um which was kind of cool to go through that like process and then when i got to san diego i came here for a job in nonprofit. um i was going to be a statewide trainer for the department of cal uh, the department of education for california and it was most of us in nonprofits don't make a lot of money and so i was making just barely a living wage and so i knew i needed more money and I said, well, what things, what talents do I have? And I was like, well, I can sing. So I auditioned for a bunch of like punk emo bands, which if anyone has ever heard me sing is really funny. Um, uh, Cause that didn't really jive well with my voice. <laughs> I don't look for it, you know, for punk emo. Um, and so I was like, what are other ways that you can make money? And I was like, oh, people get paid to do theater. Maybe I could do theater to make a little extra money. <laughs> which sounds um, so silly. <laughs> yeah, and then, so I did this reading with Sean at Signet, and then as a result of that, and Katie was in Parade, my first professional show was at the Old Globe, um, because they lost, they had to fire an actor during tech, and I was the only the non-union person available, because everyone else was working, and I was like number 40 on the list, or whatever. <laughs> I hadn't even like auditioned at the Globe, anything. Um, and they just needed like a filler. I had two lines. Um, we had an hour and 45 minutes off in the third act. It was crazy, but, um, but that's, a, and that's how I got into theater. So, um, and I've been doing it ever since, which is great. And where yeah. did you grow up, Brian? I grew up in, um, Massachusetts. My family is from Salem, Massachusetts. Um, and then we moved to a really tiny town called Topsfield, um, home to the oldest country fair in the country. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, and so, and then I moved to Connecticut for four years for school, and then I moved to San Diego almost immediately after that. Wow. Yeah. And so, um, uh, Katie, you're teaching at Grossmont still, right? Yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> a few months after I found out I was pregnant, um, I got offered a tenure track position at Grossmont College, um, which is great. And yeah. it was a lot happening. Uh, it, a lot happened last year. Um, and then this year, more has happened somehow. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I am the music theater specialist now at Grossmont College. So I teach their musical theater performance class, um, musical theater history, which is my favorite class to teach. And then um, I teach a couple other classes, narrative theory, acting one. I'll probably get into teaching other things as time goes on, but that's where I am right now. And we are uh, currently, uh, I'm teaching online, which has been anybody else who is out there who's been trying to figure out how to teach dance or voice or acting online. It's, it's a learning curve. I mean, we're getting there. And I think, I think if this has to continue into the fall, I think we'll have a better set of skills going into next semester, but it's definitely been a uh, a learning curve. But we're figuring it out. And I have a lot of students that are really enthusiastic um, and they're digital natives, so they know how to do things. They video edit just on the fly. They can put things together much quicker than, I mean, I remember taping things when you had you know, a cassette tape and you had to, the, like the little cassette tapes that you put in the bigger one and you put it into the camera and like, that's what self-taping was when I was in college. So <laughs> now when they have to do self-taping at home with their phone, I'm like, just remember, it's a lot easier than when I was your age. And then I sound like an old fogey, but I mean, <laughs> but I really, I really love teaching and I'm grateful to have, I'm grateful that we figured out how to do it remotely so that we can continue that. Um, and yeah. She's tired of your story. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, I'm working at Grossmont and I'm still choreographing and directing. I'll be, I'll be directing at Grossmont. Um, I'm slated to direct next summer, um, 
they do a summer conservancy program with right. college and high school students. So um, that is the next project I am supposed to work on at Grossmont. But yeah, with everything, you know, everything is kind of in the air, up in the air right now. But but I'm excited to keep doing that and teach. And, how has it been for you? And, and, and maybe tell me a little bit about the transition from actor to choreographer to director. Because I know that's been like in the last few years, right? Yeah, yes and no. It's funny because I've been, choreogra <laughs> They're sweet. I've been choreographing for musical theater since I was, I think the first show I choreographed, I was 18 or 19. Mm. Um, and I've, and I've been choreographing kind of on the side while being a performer and I've always done it. Um, and I've always either taught dance or been choreographing shows. And then when I went to grad school, I think, I went to grad school at SDSU um, to get my MFA. And kind of while I was there, I decided I wanted to focus more on choreographing and directing. And I think just because I put, that's where I started putting my focus more. And that's what I started talking to people about more. Um, that's kind, it kind of set that transition in motion. Um, I still performed when I got out of grad school, but then I, it really, it was very strange. Like one year I had all performing contracts and literally the next spring, it was all choreography and directing projects. Mm. And it, that's just how it lined up. Mm -hmm. It was like, there just weren't shows that I was really right for, but there was tons of choreography and directing projects. And I had, I mean, yeah, I had like my professional directing debut and, you know, did three or four other shows all in like a six month period. So it was very, um, it, it felt like it happened overnight, but it was kind of like, it was, it was a back burner thing. Um, mm -hmm. It was like, I had had multiple careers going. I mean, everybody who's an artist, I think has multiple careers going and it just kind of like switched spots. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I'm still performing, but that now that's kind of on the back burner and being a teacher and a direct choreographer now are in the front. So it's, um, so yeah, it's been, a, it's like I planted the seeds for it a long time ago and now they've just kind of come to fruition now. So. It was awesome. She, she worked so hard to like get her foot in the door at, at a lot of different places. And what was so great is to see all of that hard work come through in like six months that just like proved her work ethic. It was really awesome to watch. Do, what do you find are like the differences or the pluses minuses with how is the fulfillment different from a performing and being on the other side of the table? Um, there are a lot of things that as a performer, I felt really powerless to change. And, mm -hmm. um, and I like being behind the table and being able to change that conversation with casting and with, I haven't gotten to a position yet where I'm actually choosing what shows are being done. Although at Grossmont, I think I will have the opportunity to present and propose projects so that I can start doing that. But um, I do get to have more of a say now in how casting goes and how I run an audition room. Um, it's like when we had auditions for cabaret, it's like I could start that audition process by saying, we're looking for all types. We don't want to just cast this with the same kinds of people that you've seen on stage your whole life. And I can now put that into practice, which is nice. Um, and I can advocate for other performers who I've worked with, who I know are really talented. And I think have been, haven't gotten that chance yet because they're not the typical type. Um, mm. So it's been really nice to be able to advocate and to be able to change the conversation. Um, it does mean coming head to head with people sometimes, but luckily I think there are a lot of people in the community that were able to disagree and have a conversation about it and get those ideas out there um, and still work together well. So I, I, I very much enjoyed that part of it. Um, and I like, I like creating. I mean, I, I loved being an actor. I loved performing and dancing and doing that, but it was kind of like that season of my life just kind of naturally came to a place where I wanted to do something else. And so now getting to create more has been really fulfilling. And it was a change I needed. I just needed to, I needed a pivot of some kind because I was getting, 
I kind of felt like I was spinning my wheels a little bit. And um, it's been really nice to, to pivot without leaving the field entirely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah. Yeah. I know. I, I, I lo I've loved our conversations about, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we not ruffle feathers, but still go, Hey, maybe the old way isn't the best way. And maybe we should be more a little in inclusive and equitable. And what would that look like? It does, you know. Right. <laughs> and it's hard too, because a lot of the time I'm the only woman in the room. A lot of the time I'm the youngest person in the room. Um, I still have to convince people to hire me. I still have to be, people still have to enjoy working with me in order for me to get jobs um, because I'm not, I'm not producing my own work. I still have to have other people bring me onto their projects. So there is like a dance um, and, and a little bit of deciding what hill to die on and being diplomatic about it as well. Mm -hmm. I think there are, I mean, Sean and I have had conversations where we weren't necessarily on the same page when we started, but we found the common ground in the middle. Yeah. Um, and the, co the conversations aren't always a hundred percent comfortable, but I don't think, I don't think change is ever a hundred percent comfortable. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's been interesting. I, I like my role as an educator and being able to set some of those ideas, um, in these students that are going to go out and create the next generation and wave of art and trying to set those ideas down early. So, and I'm hoping that by like in how I teach my history class, I try to talk about incremental change and mm. um, how that happens and what you can do to, to be a catalyst for more change. So it's, I, I, I do enjoy, there was a lot of years that I spent seeing what I wanted to be different and not being able to do anything about it. And it's nice being in a couple of positions now where I can try to slowly push that, you know, kick the ball down a little bit further and get us a little bit closer where we want to be. Um, yeah. It doesn't have to be incremental though. You're right. You can't just change everything overnight. It doesn't work that yeah. way. Um, but I was looking at the numbers the other day and I oh, think yeah. it was the 2019, 2020 Broadway season. I think, I think it's something like 60% of roles on Broadway are still male and only 30% are female. And then an even a much, a very small percentage are a, a non-specified gender or non-binary. And I think, I think it's getting better, but seeing those numbers and having that, that quantitative data that there's still huge inequity. Um, yeah. It's a little discouraging, but I think, I think we're getting there. It's just, you have to be patient with the change. So. The irony is always that the majority of the audience is female identifying as well. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and if you've ever auditioned in New York, the majority of the people auditioning are female. <laughs> are female. Yeah. yeah. But I think the change is happening. Yeah. I've always respected your ability to be diplomatic and um, I've learned a little bit from you seeing the way you interact with it because sometimes I don't pick the right hill to die on. I just bark loudly. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's definitely a learned skill. When I was, when I was younger, I, I was a firecracker and I didn't know when to stop. And I, and I realized quickly that if you want anybody to hear anything you have to say, there has to be, you have to have tact and there has mm -hmm. to be a level of diplomacy. Otherwise they just hear the Charlie Brown teacher. Wah, 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 wah. That's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I have, I've had the opportunity to watch, to like be on stage with her and then be choreographed by her. Um, and it's so, it's such a cool moment to, the one thing I love about her as a collaborator on the creative side is that being someone who does not identify as a, a dancer, um, to have a choreographer who watches what you can do for movement and then creates this beautiful way of like telling a story comically or dramatically or what whatever it's called for but uses your body and isn't like demanding and saying like this is my choreography you need to do it or you are a horrible person or a horrible performer it's more about like well let's adapt it for you like what story are we trying to tell um that's what's been really cool for me to see 
um, cause she was, she's like a technical dancer too. So I remember being in ensembles with her and like, she'd pick up the choreography like that and we'd go home and I'd be like, so can you give me a private <laughs> lesson on that? Like that 10 count, that eight count, the 10 count. Cause, <laughs> I, can, I, cause I don't even know how to count. <laughs> But, uh, but that's been really cool to see. Wow. And do you, so, so what do you think was, is going to happen when theater does return? We talked a little bit about this renaissance maybe, uh, but what do you, what are some things, how do you think it will shift? I, I think there's going to be a significant paradigm shift in terms of how people prioritize their time and resources. Mm. Um, I think prior, I think prior to this, there are, all of us did it in some way, took advantage and took for granted that that theater was always going to be there, that we there's always next time, there's always next season, there's always whatever. And I think people, when they go back, I think they are going to be producing with the idea in mind that, and this, this sounds like horrible and like kind of pessimistic to say, but if this is the last show we ever produce, mm -hmm. is this the show that we want to be producing? Hmm. Like if we open up the theater and then there's a spike in COVID cases and we have to close again, is this the one message, the one project that we want to put across? Um, mm -hmm. At least that's how I'm thinking about it when we're looking at, you know, like our season for Grossmont is if we were to pop up and only get to do one show, what would that one show be? Wow. Um, mm -hmm. So I think there will be, I think people in general will be, more meaningful with how they spend their time and resources um, because there will be the, the GDP is going to shrink. People are going to, you know, I think once they can be together, I think there's going to be more focus on community experience mm -hmm. and togetherness and like what the group experience is as opposed to people's individual wants and goals. I think there'll be more of a collective approach to it. So, and I'm, Honestly, there. I was thinking about this the other day. I am most excited to, I will try to go to any opening night that I possibly can because mm -hmm. I can guarantee you, or like first audience, that the performers on stage will probably give their best performances of their lives <laughs> yeah. the first time they get to be in front of an audience again. Yeah. And like what's so great is we have an amazing community of committed artists that I think if they use this time well, which I think a lot of them are, for self-reflection and like really understanding themselves. Cause I feel like that's part of acting is if you feel comfortable in your own skin, then you can definitely feel comfortable in someone else's skin, you know, without judgment or something like that. Um, and I, that, that excites me to, to get to see this community of performers the first time they get to be in front of a live audience again. I think it's gonna be so like electrifying and exciting and yeah. people will like give it their all and then maybe they'll have a second show slump, but I'm sure the rest of the run will be fantastic. I feel like the first like yeah. months that people are performing, everybody's gonna be running on so much pent up yeah. adrenaline. <laughs> yeah. It's gonna be like we're shot out of a rocket. It's gonna <laughs> So you you talked to me about like like looking into radio plays and stuff that there might be a resurgence. You think? Yeah, I mean, well, I think it's gonna be twofold. I think while we're still mitigating and trying to do theater virtually, I think we had talked about this, mm -hmm. and it's something that you know we talked about for our season at Grossmont is the resurgence of radio plays, things that rely more on sound and mm -hmm. rely less on visual. Mm -hmm. um, because it is like kind of a, a, a lost art that I think could come back in some way. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think once we are able to start having shows publicly again, I think there will be kind of a renaissance because again, people are gonna have all this pent up creative energy. And I think once people can get in a room and create together again, people are just gonna go. There's gonna be less worrying about if people are like, gonna like it, if it's gonna produce well, if it's gonna sell tickets and people are just gonna wanna create. And I think it's gonna, I think it, there's gonna be a lot of momentum yeah. that hopefully will, I mean, my, I, we talk about it in my, my history class about how the kind of the Renaissance that happened after World War II um, in musical theater and mm -hmm. how much how much energy that put into the market and how much change there was. Um, 
And so I'm excited to see how this changes what we produce and the stories we tell, because it's, it's not going to be the same. But the challenge, I think, for artists, rightfully so, is finding that balance with the business side of theater, because those running theaters, I think, may have a different opinion on we need to sell, we need to do shows that will sell, recognizable names, yeah. those types of things. So finding that the ability to take something old and and breathe some air into it, refresh it with that creativity, well, I think will be important. I mean, it was like yeah. I mean, in the 1930s, after the stock market crash, there was like two kinds of musicals. There were total escapist musicals. Mm -hmm. There was a show called Hell's a Poppin that I tell my students it was like SNL in a musical. It was like different <laughs> skits every night, every single week it changed. And it was pure escapism. And then there were the really political pieces like the Cradle sure. Rock yeah. mm -hmm. where people needed that catharsis. And so I think, I think there'll be a mix. Mm -hmm. People are going to want to go see shows that are just fun and yeah. funny and irreverent. And they're also going to want to go see shows that help them process um, yeah. emotionally. I know. Whether they realize it or not. So. Well, little did we know that I remember at the beginning of this year, everyone was excited that we were back in the 20s and everyone wanted to relive the, the 1920s era. Little did we know that we're just going to no. have to produce radio plays. <laughs> <No. laughs> yeah. yeah, I agree. That I, I, I think that, that there will be, I mean, maybe I, maybe I can't even like describe what it will look like right now, but I do think that there'll be a different way to experience theater because we'll be so hungry for community. Yeah. yeah. For events together. I love that picture, Robbie, that you posted. It's like the two actors in the center of a circle of cars that all have their headlights pointing and it says like the, the future of theater. <laughs> yeah. uh, but part of me views that image and says, what's that play about? That looks like an exciting play. Like I wanna, like are, are people's headlights individually like, they, lighted mean, so that like they've, there's oh, yeah. and <laughs> they've already talked about driving movie theaters coming back yeah. and i'm like mm -hmm. what if we could drive in theater i was thinking that too yeah like cool. if tune into the radio station yeah yeah if you the sound system through a radio station and you played cool. it in your car and you pulled up to something that looked like the moonlight but yeah. without all the grassy i i, I, I don't even <laughs> that'd be amazing on that big of a screen I know. If they were like, like filming, like the actors were there, but then they were also filming a projection of them behind. I don't. This know. is not the revival of West Side Story, <laughs> Katie. That is on Broadway. We do not need to to <laughs> to have that happen. <laughs> but, but maybe we could. Maybe that's how it happens. Maybe that's maybe. what we do. I love that. I love that idea. I think throw it all out. I think. Uh, yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready for the new. Yeah. Yeah. Um. What do you, uh, so you talked about like artists uh, being self-reflective right now. Mm -hmm. What do you, how, how, what are you learning about yourself and your own art right now? Maybe being a parent is a part of it and isolation is another part. <laughs> I'm, I'm finding myself reconnecting with music, not mm -hmm. necessarily musical theater. Um, I have this really great, so my acapella group, we used to every semester come together and like pick the songs we were going to, make arrangements for that that semester and, and sing uh, and perform. And what was so great about that is that we all would bring like three to five songs to song selection is what we called it. You would pitch your song, you would send it ahead of time so people could listen to it. At that point, we were making like a lot of mixed CDs and stuff like that. Um, and so I reached out to them at the beginning of this year before COVID even happened. And I said, I, you know, I'm making a commitment to like, get back into music that is not theater, because I just found myself constantly listening to theater music, which is amazing and great, but I was missing like the artists that I had connected with previously. And so I asked, it was like, how about every month, everyone sends three to five songs. So we actually have like a Spotify playlist that we populate at the end of each month. And so we now like look forward to as this group of friends of like curating this oh, wow. playlist of 2020. Um, and what's been so great is like connecting better with music and finally <laughs> listening to to artists that we would not deem as theatrical and listening to like the storytelling of lyrics, which they teach you mm -hmm. in musical theater. Um, 
and like before you just listen to a song and you're like that's a great song and it's very like you almost listen to it passively i find myself listening more actively uh to songs right now and connecting more with them and kind of i would love to make that even more of my process like in the future for musicals in particular um but yeah it's it's hard to create stuff with a little one um <laughs> I had to do this self tape for, <laughs> for a show. And so we set everything up in her, where we're, we're in Juniper's nursery right now. And we set up cause it has like really good lighting um, and a good like backdrop. And what was funny is it was for a production that was very like fairy tale. And she has like mountains all yeah. over the wall. Like if you can see, like we've painted mountains all over her walls. Uh -huh. So, um, so it was this hilarious, I thought a hilarious backdrop. And so we had to put her like, Katie was helping and reading. Um, and there were so many times where Juniper would just start like babbling and talking and like really enjoyed listening to me sing. But at the end, like there was one really high note I had to sing and at the end she was like, <gasps> and that, like I sent that in my self tape cause I was like, that was the best take. I was like, do? what am I gonna do? <laughs> so. Uh, uh, no, the other time that we had to, there was one side he had to do and I was, reading all the lines but she was aside for whatever reason the reader had more lines more than lines the person than, yeah <laughs> so i'm reading all the lines on the side and holding her and making sure that the video is in the right place and i was like wait a minute why this isn't my side. <laughs> why am i working why harder? am i working so hard <laughs> but i i find myself i do find myself thinking a lot more about uh, this is so cheesy but thinking about legacy and thinking about mm -hmm how I want to start paving the path for what I want Junie to be able to do. And not just in theater, mm. but since that's my field. I mean, I think about what I want her to be able to see. And I, I mean, I want it to be different for her than it was for me. And for what, and different from what it is now. Like, I don't, I don't want her to struggle. She'll have her own struggles and she'll have her own challenges, but I want, certain things to have progressed and not have her facing the same kind of um uphill climb mm. that I have um and I think it is changing so I think I mean the momentum is there I just and I do think about what kinds of shows um also for my students now I mean now that I'm spending more time as an educator I've I've been teaching forever but now it's full time and I do think more about setting a good example as a in what I do as an artist because now I'm a teaching artist it's like now I'm constantly thinking about like if my students come to see this show that I'm working on locally am I showing them am I setting a good example for how to be creative and what kind of message to put out and how I'm working in the room and um so yeah, there's definitely, I'm, I've definitely been thinking about that a lot um, as we plan for whenever theater starts happening again. We have thought about side projects. I thought about a children's book I might want to write with somebody. I mean, we've talked about doing a cabaret for forever. For <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, and we are in a holding pattern right now. It has been nice getting to spend more time with her for sure. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But it definitely does change things in terms of how I how I think about them. So it puts things in perspective, which every parent says when they have kids. They're like, it puts everything in perspective, and it it sounds cliche, but that's it's true though. Yeah. So totally. Which is why it's a cliche. <laughs> <laughs> what a um, reflect back on something you were really proud of as a theater artist. I think for me was last year. So I made a commitment that if I was going to go equity, that I needed to, to be in a play where I had a substantial part, like a good amount of scenes. Um, cause I, I, I got not stuck cause I do love them, but like I, I did mostly musicals and like the plays I did, I was, auxiliary character like at the globe uh, like a, a spear holder like kind of role um and um so i made that commitment if i was going to go equity that i wanted to do that and i got i was super fortunate that last year i got to do two plays 
Um, and so the first play was at Diversionary Theater, we did Significant Other, and that was really great because I got to work with an awesome creative team. Katie actually came in and consulted on that for, for a couple of the dance sequences. Um, got to work with like some of my closest friends. And so it was a very like safe environment to play. Um, and I, and that was great. And then I, um, I did a show at North Coast Rep uh, this fall, The Sunshine Boys, and I played the nephew, which is like this big heaping role. Um, and it, I think I grew a lot during that process from mm -hmm. the rehearsal room to working with like two awesome Broadway veterans and like sitting there and watching and learning from them. Um, like I, because I don't have any theater training for me, the best way to learn how to be a good actor is to sit and observe, mm -hmm. um, and to ask questions. And so I was really fortunate that, that, that those two older gentlemen let me do that. Um, cause sometimes I think it's weird when you're not in the scene to like, just sit there and watch and sometimes actors get uncomfortable. Uh, luckily they didn't. Um, but I would just kind of observe them and it was, it was a it was a huge challenge, but I'm very proud of myself through that production. Um, I feel like I learned a lot, um, which I think is for me is like the the biggest accomplishment for me. And it was more of like it was a comedic dramatic role, which I don't get cast in a lot, um, and I I really liked it. You know, that's probably why you're such a talented actor. Is that you take your ego out and you stay curious. You know what I mean? Like the fact that you don't feel like you have it, you know, that you keep, you keep probing and, and humbling yourself. It's yes. probably why you keep growing and are so good. <laughs> the only thing I will ever say that I have is I don't have an embarrassment reflex. Mm. Um, yeah. which I think allows me to, to just play when I'm in a comedy. Um, and it annoys the crap out of Katie. <laughs> Cause yeah. she's like, she goes, just in our personal I, life. Goes, I don't understand. How did you, you just did that? And I was like, yeah, what, whatever. I don't know. It'll be okay. You have no shame reflex. No That's shame true. reflex. <laughs> the only thing I have going for me. What about you? Um, I, I have received a few, um, since I started working more predominantly as a choreographer, um, I've received a few texts, phone calls, had conversations with people that they appreciated the process of the, the rehearsal process or the audition process. Um, uh, a rehearsal or audition process that I led. And I have had a couple of other girls that I used to work with um, in the ensemble that we all were in the ensemble together and they're, and they've asked me like how I got into choreography and like how much they enjoy working with me and how I create a positive environment. And it just things that like, I, I care about the final product, but I care the most that when, when I leave a room of having worked with a group of, of performers for a period of time, I want them to feel better about themselves as artists and feel great about the performance that they that we created together so when I have somebody tell me that they feel like I worked with their skill set or that I played to their strengths and that I created a room that was positive in some way and that they had a good experience um, especially in an audition because auditions are terrifying inherently or at least I thought they were um, so if I get a text message after an audition that says, you know, I just had a lot of fun. That was like, I haven't had that much fun dancing in a while. Like that, that to me is, is enough. Um, because I, that's the experience that I was always chasing as a performer. I mean, you get to do, getting to perform in itself is wonderful, but if you can also have a really positive experience in how that show is built, um, that's an added bonus. And so if I can do that, and um, be a good example of somebody who started humbly from the very bottom, just being, you know, the third girl from the left. Um, and then as a creator, not taking that for granted and remembering what it was like to be that person and making every person feel valued. Mm -hmm. um, if I can do that, then I, 
that's that's what makes me feel the most accomplished. So. I'm proud of you for choreographing me and Megan Car Mitchell having <laughs> sex on stage right. <laughs> <laughs> while keeping a straight face. <laughs> yeah, that was it. Was interesting choreography. You were really good in that show, Brian. Thanks. <laughs> Rock of Ages was just interesting because there's there's a whole song with a lap dance and I was pregnant <laughs> at the time and like demonstrating doing a lap dance when you're pregnant. There's just something that just feels a little weird about that. It was a, it was a fun experience, but that was a little odd a couple of times to be like holding my belly while I'm, you know, straddling a chair. Because Heather Bros told us that the, our one goal <laughs> is to keep Junie off the pole. <laughs> because <laughs> she would have already been on it so it's true <laughs> yeah it's but. interesting you say that katie because i was reading an article that the mellon foundation put out they did this study of they interviewed artists from across lots of fields and they found they found things in common that what helped them sustain a career and the main thing that helped every artist sustain a career was validation was the feeling of feeling a positive reinforcement for what they were doing. And, and I think that so much, you know, as someone who is, you know, in charge of the whole, being yeah. like, you know what, if I'm gonna get the best work, it's not gonna be with cruelty. It's going to be with a positive outlook constantly. And I agree with you on that. And, I, and it stuns me to see the number of creatives that, still dig in their heels and want it done their way and get frustrated that people can't do what they want them to do for their ideal vision of what the show should be. And I just, I just, I've, I've sat in the room on a lot of new shows. I've swung four mm -hmm. new shows. So I've sat in the room and watched these shows being built. It's different when you're rehearsing a show that has like set, chore like original choreography of this, where it is, you know, a set scripting that you have to follow. But when you're creating new choreography, I don't see why you shouldn't tailor it to the people who are there in the room. And I've seen different choreographers approach it differently, but I just, I, I, there's nothing to be gained from beating your head against a wall, you know, trying to achieve one thing that doesn't, that doesn't fit the people that you have there with you. Um, and that's why I try to be flexible. Like I always come in with a plan. I mean, I always come in with everything completely done and choreographed to the nth degree, but then when you get in there, you just have to be loose. You have to be flexible. Mm. If you see somebody, like, I, it's why I love working. When we did Rock of Ages, the girls that I had on that, uh, Bailey, Tamara, and um, Siri, they did, there were so many things that they did that I would never have thought to choreograph. Mm. I would never have thought to do that. Mm. But I would ask them, I'd be like, well, guys, I kind of need this, and these are the parameters, and can you kind of play, and can I help mm. edit? But can I see what, like, you do best? Because there was a lot of scenes where, like, they were being the strippers, and it's like, if they were actually doing this as professionals, they would choreograph things that fit their skill set. And they would start doing things that I didn't even know was possible. <laughs> like wow. I didn't know that was humanly possible to, 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 to do that. And I wouldn't have known to ask of the, for that. But those ended up being some of the best sequences were the ones that we worked on collaboratively. And so I just don't see the purpose of creating in a vacuum and then trying to instill that vision on other people. Mm. It just doesn't, to me, it doesn't make sense. Well, especially so, as we try to like diversify our artists, mm -hmm. I think, especially with like younger artists coming forward, um, that like without the validation, they're likely to just leave and give up mm -hmm. and say, I'm good. So if that, if that continues to be the approach, I think that yeah. we will still struggle to diversify our, our artists. Um, because okay. eventually someone's going to say, that's enough. I've spent my whole life being put down and all these other things. I'm not going to take it here. I'll go do something else worth my time. Um, so I think that that's like an important part about yeah. that validation piece too. You mentioned something that I think is uh, something interesting to talk about. And it's what I consider the hardest job in all of theater, which is to be a swing. And you both <laughs> have had a lot of experience doing it. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? 
for sure. For people, for people who maybe are interested but have no idea what it, it entails. For yeah. Katie, uh, Katie wrote her thesis on swinging. Um, oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah, I I don't know what happened. I mean, I think what happens actually is that once you get a job as a swing once, and it, especially if you go on and it's a sink or swim moment, you really don't know if somebody's going to be a good swing until they they do it. Um, but then once you have done it successfully, then people just want to hire you to do that because it is it is a special skill set um, that... You know, I the sh first show that I swung was Freaky Friday, and I covered six, seven, six or seven tracks. Mm -hmm. I don't remember exactly. Um, you know, six or seven people who each had some of them only played one character, most of them played multiple characters. Um, and I was so terrified of failure <laughs> in that moment because it was mm -hmm. my first big job at La Jolla Playhouse, and I was just terrified that I was going to F it up. So I, I, I've never been more focused in a rehearsal room. I watched every single moment of every single rehearsal because I figured if I just know the entire show, then I'll know every track and then my job and then that, and that's my job. Um, and by the time that show closed, I probably could have just done a one woman version of that whole show from top to bottom for every track wow. because you watch wow. it that many times it's like in order to know your part you also have to know the part on either side of you and you just it's just easier to learn the whole thing <laughs> but um well, it made me a lot yeah. more aware it made me a lot more aware of the creative process as a whole and it made me watch actors a lot more and I learned a lot I mean, I've always watched other actors when I was in a room, but I always had my part that I had to focus on. Mm -hmm. And when I didn't have that and I was focusing on the show as a whole, I learned a lot as a choreographer as well and as a director. I mean, I because I spent so much time observing process. Um, and I think it, it did set me up well when I wanted to start directing more because I had spent so much time. I mean, there's all these observerships that you can do mm -hmm. where you're essentially there to observe mm -hmm. a rehearsal process. Mm -hmm. And I got to do that four times as a, a swing and got to be in the room and, and sit in the back of the room and watch it all unfold. So it was, but it was scary. I'm terrified. I think about what things that I did as a swing. And if I had to do that now, I'd be terrified. I can't believe I did that. That was another person, some superhuman person. Because Katie went past. on, she, <laughs> someone during Escape to Mar Margaritaville on closing weekend, um, oh the, the second to last show, so the matinee, um, someone was walking backstage and broke their foot at the end of act one while they were walking backstage in wedges or whatever. That was terrifying. And so the stage manager came to Katie, who basically like, was packing up her station. It's the last day. You shouldn't, and I learned never, after yeah, that, never, never pack, pack up, up your station day. before the uh, last show closed. Had to go on for act two, and then did the final show of Escape to Margaritaville at Lloyd Playhouse that night. Wow. Because the, the, the girl had broken her foot. Well, I mean, the first time I went on, I went on with no rehearsal for yeah. Freaky Friday, because somebody got sick right after opening, and you usually start understudy and swing rehearsals the week after we open. Right. And... Instead, I just went on with no rehearsal, which was terrifying. And again, I can't believe I did that and didn't die. There were two turntables in that show. I'm shocked <laughs> that I didn't <laughs> injure yeah. myself. And then yeah. I, I think I went on with like an hour and a half notice. So I went on for the second show of the day with no rehearsal. Um, and, yeah, that's right. and it's so funny uh, my other favorite story actually was um, at Signet. I was swinging Rocky Horror. Um, I was there the show. Oh, the show that Michael, we were. Why were we? And we were both on stage. Yes. And Michael, watching but this. later in the run, <laughs> this is this is what can happen. So later in the run, I had done like a nice twelve and a half, twelve and a half, thirteen shows as riffraff because um, Sean had gotten sick and Michael moved up to to Frankenfurter. And so I went in for riffraff. So I got this like really kind of nice little mini run of riffraff, felt pretty good with it. But then kind of like for the rest of the run, Katie Sapper and I just sat up there in the balcony mm -hmm. singing some of the ensemble stuff, just kind of chilling in the darkness. And, um, and I think it was like maybe a week before we closed at 15 minutes, all of a sudden Maria Mangiavello comes in and she goes, Brian, we need you to go on for riffraff. And I said, what, 
Michael was on for the matinee. What happened? <laughs> and she's like, he pulled his back. We don't know what it, he was stretching and something happened. We need you to go on. And so <laughs> I love Maria dearly. And she was like very close to me. She was like, she goes, do you, do you need me? What do you need? What, what can I do for you? And I looked at her and I said, what I need you to do right now is leave me alone. <laughs> Uh, and I, I went on and, and it was fine. It's, it's funny once you do it the first, the first time is the scariest. It's terrifying. And then if you get the chance to do the same track again, it's like you, it's like when we were in mixtape, like oh, when we no. would go in for mixtape and then we would not be in mixtape for a while, then go in again. You don't really need a rehearsal. You kind of like your body starts to remember the track because you at least did it once. It's like the first time any actor does the best way to feel here. This is. The best way to feel like a swing is design a run through its signet. <laughs> uh, or no, uh, uh, first first uh, invited dress of signet, which is like the first time that like the show is being put together with all the technical elements, everything. And you feel that like, oh my God, everything is going wrong. Nothing is working. Like, but I don't know how to but do it. But it still happens. But it still happens. And it's amazing. And it's amazing. Um, and I have a very silly story about the first time I went on for Heart of Rock and Roll at the Globe, um, our, one of the New York actresses pulled me aside the next day and she's like, I have to, I have to talk to you. And I said, what? She goes, my sister came and saw the show yesterday. And I was like, oh, um, and you know, she, we were talking about it and she goes, oh, but like the swing was on. And I was like, oh, well, okay. And, uh, and she was like, she goes, no. She like, she pointed you out and she, she was like, wait, he was the swing? He was my favorite part. I thought this other person was the swing. And it was like, it, it was crazy. Wow. Um, so that was like, but like you think everything is going wrong, especially most swings are like super observant, very detail oriented. So you, you spend the entire time being like, I didn't do that one move right. Or like, oh, I like said the line, but I forgot this one two letter word. Like those types of things stay in your head, but no one in the audience would ever know. So it, it once you get over that hump of like realizing that if you've done the work ahead of time, the preparation, you'll be great. So, is there like a stigma attached to swinging? Yeah. Like when I was an assistant director, I I got to the point where I was so good that pe people would never consider me to direct anything. <laughs> They were like, no, you're the, you're the, you're the assistant. I'm like, oh, hmm. Career swings tell me that if you start taking too many swing jobs, that they will cast a more talented person as a swing than in the actual show because swinging is harder. Yeah. Depending on what the show is. It's their insurance policy. Yeah. And you can't get into that trap where it's like, if they have to decide whether to put somebody in an ensemble track mm -hmm. or to make them a swing, and they know they can swing, they'll make them the swing because they know that that's yeah. more difficult in some ways. And right. so, yeah, you can't get into that trap where it's like you're too good at that. But some people like doing that. Yeah. And I, I think that could be also what we see change with theater is that more theaters are going to have an insurance policy with COVID-19. Because, you know, we've been talking about, like, do you, do you have two, a cast A and a cast B? And cast B is rehearsed isn't compensated unless they go on. And if someone in cast A gets COVID, does the entire cast A go into quarantine for two weeks and cast B comes in? Wow. Or do you just have a swing for the, like a general swing for like one for the male tracks and one for the female identifying tracks and just like, that's your insurance policy. Like what, what will theater's insurance policies be in case someone gets sick? That's like, to wow. me, the most interesting thing because it's, it's cost prohibitive to have that like dual cast thing, but you talk to companies and they've put their workers on split shifts. So like this group of four people comes into the office on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. This group comes in Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday so that we can continue to run. If someone gets sick on group A, then group B takes over for the whole week. Like mm -hmm. it, it's, but it's, you know, you can't do that in theater. So like, what will the insurance yeah, policies be? Or can you? I mean, you know, yeah. maybe we'll all be desperate enough to say, yes, I will be in cast B. <laughs> and if I get to go on, that'll be great. And if not, great. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you have a show and tell for me? We do. We, 
we really, really struggled to think of anything that we own that we care about um, because there's just not a lot of material things that that are really, I mean, we don't have family heirlooms in, mm -hmm. in either of our families, but we were talking about like, if we, if there was a fire and we had to run out of our house, um, we would obviously grab Juniper. Um, yeah. I'd probably honest to God, grab my external hard drive because it's like an archive yeah. of my life. Yeah. And musical theater. All of our photos, <laughs> all of our photos are on there. I have documents on there and journals from like my I mean since high school so I mean weirdly I would probably grab that mm -hmm. but the only thing that's not replaceable in in our house that we would also maybe grab is we have some really talented friends who have created some original art for us that mm -hmm. we have and we would probably grab that so this is one of them Margaret Larlon who used to teach at SDSU she and I did okay. a show together at um oh wow um at a she and I did a show together at SDSU and she made that pastel for me of, um, of our director watching us during one of uh, our rehearsals. Your mentor. Um, really. Yeah. And mm -hmm. so I really, we really love that. And then our friend Doug does these incredible cartoons. Yeah. So Doug Schmidt, um, he does these awesome cartoons when you're in a show. Oh yeah. Um, and so and here I'm trying these. to like get it so you can see. So this is us like doing Miracle on 34th Street together. So sometimes he does that. And then he did this like really adorable one of Juniper because she was born in <laughs> December. Oh. Um, but we have an entire um, we gallery seen. of, I don't know, like it's we, a giant we, picture frame with all of the ones he's ever done of us. And they're just oh. so fun. And he captures people's personalities and like, what they're doing and the stories they're telling in his in his uh drawings that he does which which is awesome and he works for suzy zoo right suzy zoo. zoo cartoon which is like the little ch chick duck? duck it's a duck um but they're on like a lot of greeting cards and stuff like that so he works as like an art director there um and helps to like recreate a lot of it so he draws in that style which is really cool as well mm. but um we but yeah, those are we the only it. those are the only things that we have that aren't replaceable. Everything else is mm -hmm. just stuff. That's true. Yeah. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And thank you for talking to me. Yes. It's so nice to get to see you finally. <laughs> Can you believe it's Juniper? Over 50 days. Isn't that crazy to think about? That is wild. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Bye. Junie's dancing. Bye. Junie's dancing. Bye. Say bye-bye, <laughs> Junie. Say bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Oh. <laughs> bye, Robbie.